thank you all for coming out, first of all. Um, I've been looking forward to this conversation for a very long time. I've been having it with candy in my head long before the art you know, exhibition uh, opened. And I said, you know, there are a long list of questions I want to ask her. But we're going to start first with um, some short video clips. And then I will sort of pick up where the video clips leave off. And then we'll have our conversation. Um, I don't want to bore you all to death with my voice, but I think you all are actually here to find out more about her work. So we're going to begin with a short clip about her, her early beginnings. That's smart, Velcroing. I'm gonna do that. I need a Velcro. <laughs> Velcro fixes everything. I can never find the control. There we go. A bit about me. I was born in the 80s. On my 80s baby, I was born in New Jersey, in a small town called Bayonne, which is a two mile radius town near Newark. So for those New Jerseyans out there listening, I'm here representing. <laughs> I have an older brother who's in Orlando, so he's actually over here. Um, my parents are from Dominican Republic, and they immigrated here to the United States. My mom came first, and she was brought here, you know, from her father, who actually had a work visa. Um, she came legally, and she brought her brothers and sisters, and we created this really large family here in the United States. So. This is me, I'm assuming I'm one and a half, maybe. And these are all of my cousins, or I should say a portion of them. And I'm actually back here in the background. So I decided to include this picture because it has a lot to do with why I create what I create, but also the imagery that comes from these kinds of things that I saw growing up in the city. Um, really, it reinforces what it is that I create. So I also wanted to share that I wasn't born an artist. I, I tell this to my students all the time because they think that all of a sudden you become one of the Renaissance uh, masters without practice. So I like to introduce this into my talks just to showcase that, you know, I'm a, I'm a kid and <laughs> I do have kids draw, right? So we have this idea of what the sun looks like. And of course, for some reason, my son had to be cool, so he has sunglasses on, we have those clouds that look like cotton balls. For some reason, there was always kind of like this key format for my houses and the way that I do them instead of having the traditional like square or rectangular shape. But I continue that kind of um, notion when it comes to the windows, right? So we have these plus signs. Um, my dad also liked to draw or so I would like to think that I get some of my drawing skills or observational skills from him. So this is this drawing above mine. And his, this is his rendition of what I looked like at that point in time in the 90s. So what I'm going to say has to deal with environment and people that are being represented within my environment. I didn't connect the dots for a very, very long time, but grad school really helped to understand why I was doing what I was doing and how growing up in these environments really impacted on my work. So I didn't think that I was going to be an artist. And yet here you are. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I wanted to, I, if you could actually leave that piece up, I wanted to begin with that piece because as I was doing the research for this conversation today, there was a theme that kept coming up about connecting the dots. And when I first saw that piece, a lot of your work made a whole lot more sense to me, right? In terms of, you know, thinking about people and the environment that that they emerge out of. I mean, at your at the heart, you're a portrait artist, right? Correct. Yeah. And how how early did you how how early in your career did you understand that that's what that was going to be your form? that was going to be your like portraiture mm -hmm. um i think it was like seventh grade okay so i mean i was drawing like any other kid you know like which is why i like to present that all the time 
because I felt like I was taught how to create and how mm-hmm. to develop my skills. So we did a lot of like technical studies. So there was a lot of still lives, which my students hate. But they're like really important because you're training your eye to be able to show that on paper. So creating something that looks three dimensional, that's really two dimensional. So there was a lot of that, like a lot of still lives, a lot of watercolors. Um, I was fortunate enough, even though I went to a school that was underfunded, the two art professors that we had at that school went to like top art school. So they were trying to like build that out of their students Mm -hmm. that come from inner city neighborhoods um that was their goal so a lot of the ways that they taught us was very technical and not only in like drawing but like in painting we had a dark room so there was photography um we did ceramic we did printing like anything that they can create and make like simple for us so that we can understand it but also on a technical level um they threw at us which was nice Mm -hmm. but i didn't know i wanted to do portraits until um we like often look through magazines in class and we try to like replicate what that person looked like or what the space looked like from the magazines and sometimes they would make us do like oil like on top of the magazine page like Mm. oil um not painting but oil pastels on top and like learning how to blend so that the colors look like that color so it was a way of doing like color theory and also um, learning proportions that way, which mm. when I was doing it, I'm like, this is so dumb. Like, why are we doing this? <laughs> like, why are we putting it on top of the paper when we could do it on the other paper? But it makes sense. Mm-hmm. Um, so the first time I tried a portrait on my own without doing it that way, I was like, oh, I'm good at this. And I can get better because okay. I can see the things that were not right. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, I would say like seventh grade. Seventh grade, that's pretty early in, in, in things. I got excited when it got to when it came to portraiture. Like okay. landscapes were okay. Like I understood landscapes. Mm-hmm. I was so over still lives <laughs> um, by that point because mm-hmm. everything was a still life. Um, and I love photography too. Oh, okay. And what I took photos of was people. <laughs> okay. So you never you, you knew people. That was my that thing. Was thing. Yeah, that was your thing. Which is interesting because I think when you look at this drawing. Mm-hmm. That's what features most prominently, right? right. The people in the foreground, but then also the picture that your dad draws, you know, it's got all these people. So it's really, but it, it, it's interesting because, you know, when I saw this, I was like, yeah, people in their environment, right? You know, right. the outdoors. And we'll come back to the, 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 the sun with the sunglasses, right? Yeah. So I think even at this age, your swag element was already, <laughs> it was already emerging, right? Because, you know, who thinks to put sunglasses on the sun, right? But I got to be a that. cool sun. Yeah, what are you right? talking about? <laughs> that, that's important, right? But I think, you know, this is an interesting sort of point to, to, to jump into, right? Because I think so many people see an exhi- exhibition like this and they're like, oh, well, this is, you know, always been, been oh, the no. thing, you know? And I think to be able to, look back and think back to and you know i appreciate the fact that somebody kept this for yeah my dad so this is the only picture i have of my artwork this young like this is the youngest drawing on a napkin wow um i don't know why he took a pic but my dad takes he always took a lot of pictures okay even now he's like probably recording my kids doing something so like (laughs) He loves the the to be able to photograph things and because okay, I was wondering, I was like, this is a really, this, <laughs> you know, it's like I don't know, I I don't know where any of the stuff even from high school is, far right? Less for for elementary school, you know. So I think we're gonna. There's another clip to give us a little bit more because I'm really curious about the mm-hmm. education. You know, how how does one? And that's one of the things a lot of young kids ask, like, how did you get to this point? You right. Know? So this is a short clip that gives us a glimpse into that. School, high school, we didn't have the same issues that we had at Georgia Middle. So again, it was a predominantly African American school. It was in Opelika. It was considered a, a F school by the time we graduated, which means that there wasn't enough funding for us to create. So we got used to making art out of things that we found. So there was a lot of leftover cardboard that I had just laying around the house or whatever work we had to found something. And we would use the materials that we had to create things. When I went to New World School of the Arts, there was materials for us, which was something that was totally 
different than what I was used to. So there was paint, any kind of color you wanted, any kind of material you wanted, how, you know, however big your sheet of paper would have been. But I was still used to creating works from found objects. So this is one of those pieces from high school. I think it was three by four feet, and it's an image of one of my best friends from high school, and it's in charcoal and concrete. I'm not connecting the dots at this point in my life. I keep I saying that. It's you and your dots. Uh -huh. in. It's just that I'm, I gravitate towards certain um, images that I take, and I'm trying to replicate them in a uh, 3D format. But, you know, of course, drawing or painting. So, you know, I, I'm in love with this piece. I think you have to figure out a way <laughs> it, to replicate it. You have to, like, it, it's no longer around. Yeah. But I, I think it would be interesting for you to redo yeah. that now hmm. to see what it, but tell me a little bit about, I mean, if this is high school, to me, I look at this and I'm like, this is highly technical for high school. Yeah. The drawing itself, the perspective even of, of you know, that you have of this, of this person on the train, I'm going to say, a train or bus? Yeah, we took the metro. So this is like a story of, of um, transportation. So in, in, in middle school, when we went to New Orleans, my mom would drop me off. And it was maybe like a 20-minute drive because we lived in Miami Gardens and the, the school was in Opalaka. But then when we got into New World School of the Arts, which you have to audition for, it's in downtown Miami, we had to take a bus, then to take the metro, and then get off the metro and walk to get to school by 725, oh my which means that I had to wake up at 5 every day, take my bus by 530. That takes me to the metro station. She will probably be there by like 6.20ish. Take the metro, get off the metro by 7, and then walk, and hopefully we're in class by 7.25. And then repeat the thing back. So by the time I got home, it was 5.30, which was time for dinner, then homework, and whatever my mom needed us to do, and then go to sleep. Wow. So we all did this. And she's still my best friend, but we were friends in middle school, so okay. we like... It was one of the processes of like getting on the bus and doing all that stuff. Um, and it was a photograph that I took from my Nikon in high school. Oh. So I was still thinking about photography and taking pictures of people. Mm -hmm. um, and I love monochromatic anything. Mm -hmm. um, and I also really love to draw. Like even the stuff that's in here, they're also drawings. Like you have to learn the technical part of creating something to be able to play. Mm, which is what I tell my students all the time. Like you, you think Picasso just like all of a sudden changed the game <laughs> because he didn't know how to draw? No, he was technical, like mm -hmm. really young. Um, and then got bored with it and started doing a whole mess of weird stuff. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But That's interesting. But, but the use, I mean, I think there's something you said, you talked about using found objects, right? And I also feel like as part of the technical aspect of it, is that you also have to think outside of the box if you don't have all mm -hmm. of the things we imagine that artists have at their disposal, right? So, you know, a piece of cardboard isn't just a piece of cardboard, right? When right. you're really trying to think, okay, you know, I want to do this drawing, but I may not have the kind of paper or the right. texture of paper or the weight of paper that I want. You know, how do you think that those early beginnings shaped the kind of work that you make now in terms of thinking about what you look at and like, oh, I can use that or, oh, I can use this, right? I'm looking at that door, like <laughs> the That's screen. That's interesting <laughs> because I never got that question, which is um, interesting. Yeah, I feel like the middle school not having the supplies that we needed and the teachers figuring out how we can all share and mm -hmm. make some good stuff with with things that you wouldn't think you can make good stuff with mm -hmm. um impacted us yeah. i think that that plus you know being in a huge family of immigrants <laughs> it was um, always whatever was left resources was right whatever there is <laughs> yeah um you have to work with mm -hmm. and make things with like i didn't connect that with the yarn either even though i had like you know some rolls of yarn but 
it wasn't something like, oh, this is what I have, so let's see what happens. Mm -hmm. Which is interesting because it's what I had, so let's see what happens. Right. <laughs> <laughs> no, because the first time I saw that piece on the door, I was like, who looks at the door and decides, oh, yeah, that's something I could paint on? It was an experiment. Okay. So, like, my okay. mom wanted to redo her um, the door from the back of the house because she wanted to use hurricane doors okay. at that point. Um, and she was going to throw them away. And I'm like, oh, I kind of want to paint on glass. And you have glass. So <laughs> let's see what happens. And then there's a story that comes out of that, too, which is interesting. Um, repurposing this thing that you just discard, um, like yarn, like clothes, mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. a lot of the materials. But, mm -hmm. that, but I feel like that conceptually, for me, comes later. Mm -hmm. I feel like intuitively I just create and then the meanings in some pieces come later. Okay. So that's, it's interesting because when I heard you say that, I immediately thought about all of the different kinds of things from the wire for the, some of the, chick, you know, the kind of chicken wire, all <laughs> kinds of, it, it really strikes me about your work that it seems like you're, whatever you look at has a potential to become oh yeah a, an object of art or a, me, a piece of, of an art project, which I think is unique and different because so many so many people who are very technical they stay, it's the paper right. it's right they they stay within that because they want to keep that technical aspect pure yeah i get bored that's the problem <laughs> like i just i can't like anything could be anything mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um see this is this is an important lesson for students <laughs> today like boredom is important yeah right? because if you're over schedule which we tend to do with our kids these right. days, they don't have any time to like sit and daydream. Right. Or, you know, because a lot of important and interesting ideas happen in those moments of, what can I do with that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, so that's interesting. That's interesting. We'll take the, the next one. Wait, I think we go back one to where the three, one more? No? Okay. Okay, no, then maybe there was the one with the three. Okay, so no, I guess no. That's, it's, yeah, so I guess I'm sorry. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Ah, uh, there it is, yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's it. I graduated from the Law School of the Arts. I got into my building in Kentucky College of Art for a year, and then the market crashed. Um, my mom lost her job, so I had to come back to Florida, and I ended up going to the University of South Florida. While I was there, I decided that I wasn't going to do art because, you know, it's, you hear it all the time, you're going to be a starving artist, like, what is it that you're going to do with your life? So I decided to major in business. So, um, I did business for a year at the University of South Florida, and that was a very low point in my life. I wasn't creating, and it got to the point where I had to make work. So after my business classes, I would stay out in the um, corridor where I lived, and I would just paint. Somebody came by and they said, oh, you know, you know, USF has an art program. And I was like, duh, Candy, why didn't you research the <laughs> university's art program? So I applied for grants. I got into the art school or the art program, so I double majored. Um, I got my BSA in painting and also my BS in management and marketing because I wanted to manage and market my artwork. <laughs> so I thought that was a smart move and it has actually helped a lot when it comes to my career. So these are some of the pieces that I was creating for my undergraduate portfolio to get into grad school. Again, you can see that there's figures. And at this time, I just thought it was, you know, just normal people that I was painting. I didn't really connect the dots to, you know, and you're painting minority. And there's a reason why you're painting minority. It was just something that I was attracted to. And it wasn't just individuals, but it was also part like things that were part of their culture. I should say part of my culture. So the swag out um, outfits or uh, the tennis shoes or the um, SB Dunks, um, the Nikes and, and piles of them, right? So these become collector items, which is why we have a lot of people that stand in line for hours 
to get these kids and students because years pass by and there actually was a lot of money just like anything not now um NFTs. So I was state of what it was that I was interested but I wasn't connecting the dots to see what it was that I was creating. Okay. So that last statement mm -hmm. was really and I'm saying this particularly so there's a certain person in the room that has NP dunks on their Christmas list. Mm -hmm. And I was like, that was a thing back then. <laughs> <laughs> and I was I was like, oh, because I didn't know they were like, I thought they were new kind of shoes. It's no. only when I saw this. And I was like, because I'm again, where does a 10 year old learn about NP dunks, right? <laughs> Apparently. It's a thing. It's a thing. That's right. And but connecting that. And the value of contemporary art to think about the relationship between, you know, what what are vintage, right, right, <laughs> vintage clothes, vintage tennis shoes, throwbacks, you know, but to connect that to the way in which art acquires value to me was just like a stroke of brilliance, you know. I mean, I was just like, it puts a different spin on it, but I yeah. think you have to be thinking, making the connections between art and the fashion industry as well. You know, talk a little bit more about that. I mean, do you, do you attribute that to your business school training or is this just like your aesthetics, right? That you're always looking at what people are wearing and, you know, that that kind of style of the individual. Um, I think I'm just attracted to people who like own what they think is cool. Okay. Like people that go to thrift stores that don't have money. Again, we go back to like materiality. Mm -hmm. Um, and just pick out these outfits that you never could like put together, but on them it looks fabulous. But if you try it on, you're like, what the fuck? <laughs> um, so, and then being confident with the outfit too. I feel like my husband does that constantly too, which is probably one of the reasons why I'm attracted to him is <laughs> like being able to put these things together. Like my brain doesn't work like that. Mm. So when I see people that can do that, I'm just in awe. Like, how did you do that? <laughs> um, and, but all this to say, like the SB Dunks connection to, I had a, a boyfriend who was like super into shoes. And I get so upset because I'm like, why are you standing in line to pay all this money for these shoes? He's like, you have no idea. Like, I'm going to buy them and then I'm going to flip them. And I'm like, oh, like housing, like artwork. <laughs> okay, like I understand. It's like, you know, it's a business opportunity yeah, that they're yeah. doing and being able to. And there's like a whole like SB Dunks. Um, event like a weekend thing that happens in Miami where all like all these art collectors get together and they trade shoes and sell shoes and it's like this whole market of like sneakers which your daughter is apparently on too which is probably why she wants to maybe I don't know <laughs> I, I, again you know all kinds of odd things show up on Christmas lips right yeah and it was and I, I saw it I replayed this section a couple of times and I was like you know how is it that kids you know she's in, in the fifth grade SV dunks are, you know, 15, 15 yeah, years ago. Yeah, right? it comes back just like it, fashion, same thing. That's true. That's Bell true. Bottoms Bell bottoms are coming out. I'm like, what's happening, and Target? Rumpers, <laughs> yes. jumpers, right? They're making a comeback, right? And I think it's interesting to think about it as an aesthetic, right? Because, mm -hmm. you know, the, I always say to my students, you have to ask yourself, like, what's going on in American pop culture at this moment that's bringing back these things mm -hmm. that went out 25 years ago? You know, is it simply nostalgia? Or is there a difference in, you know, like the, generation. the generations and how they see themselves? Because typically it's like we think our kids are not going to want to wear what we wore. Mm -hmm. And yet. Here we are. Right. Here we are. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Jumpers, dunks, you know, all of these different things. I think that's one of the things that I am interested in when it comes to like portraying these people, too, because even their outfits, they might like go out of fashion. But at some point it'll come back in fashion, which means your artwork will always be relevant relevant like in the thing like um um barkley hendrix paintings i'm in love with barkley hendrix if you guys don't know who he is just google him like his yes. style and his paintings of the 70s and 80s and what people were wearing that's what i want to do but with my fiber work because i feel like i've done it with my paintings and they're huh like in comparison to his but i feel mm -hmm. like at least with fiber it's a different way of looking at the work and also the message mm -hmm. 
um, and the person right? and the person. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think that that I mean, there are a lot of portrait artists out there. Yeah. But when you see a Rockley Hendrix, you, like, know. you know, I mean, because it's not just the portrait, but it's the cool. I was about to like there's actually a quality. There's mm -hmm. a texture to the mood. Yeah. That which is weird to talk, think about paint in that way. But he does that <laughs> like through colors, through the, the way he represents lighting. It's it's a, his paintings are a mood in themselves. Yeah, I had a teacher in my undergrad who like would describe paint as delicious. <laughs> like she would come back and be like, oh my god, that's such a delicious color. I just want to eat the paint. And now when I'm when I'm teaching, I'm like, oh my god, look at that. And my <laughs> students are like, what's wrong with you? But like his paintings are like that. Yeah, like they're yeah. so um, like living. Yeah, within yeah. its works. Yeah. So it's interesting because there's one portrait piece that he has that pink is in the background. Oh. And it's yeah. like, I just keep thinking about melting ice cream, like strawberry. So it makes sense, right? Because they're colors that certainly can evoke smell, scent, you know, and, and even texture, right? Yeah, when I'm like thick. cotton oh candy. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So it's it's interesting to think about that. But this this picture in particular, right, Monique, almost all of the people that you seem to have in your portraits have like so much attitude. Oh, yeah. <laughs> like they, that. you know, and, and not attitude in a negative way, but Confidence. They're like, yeah, yeah, it's it's confidence. This is, you know, Jamaicans have this thing that, where they say, see me here, see mm. me here. Like, <laughs> it, it's like, it's not just I'm here. It's like, but see me here. Th this is like, that's a good title. Yeah, yeah, think about that. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it's, it, again, it's what, it's what she's wearing. It's the, the gaze, mm -hmm. right? She's not looking out into a distance, which is what typically we think about classic portraiture, portraiture yeah right she's like looking right at you and giving you the side eye at the same time right <laughs> so there's so much i mean is that because these aren't people that are sitting for you these are people you're just taking photographs yes of. so are you directing them or this is just like what you get in a series of photographs uh, it's really hard because like monique i knew her because she was a girlfriend of my cousin mm -hmm. but she's also like very shy but really? she has swag. <laughs> so like I had to, and this is when most of the people that I end up taking pictures of, like when they walk into a room, they just like take the breath of the room by just their presence. I, and I don't know if they like Are recognize it. Yeah. Like when Kai, the one in the middle, I met him through Dr. Saunders because he went to um, her birthday party. And the minute he walked into the room, I'm like, who is that? <laughs> like just, you know, to be able to get that um feeling and a lot of people don't know that they do that to certain people mm -hmm. um which is interesting because like anybody and everyone can be a model mm -hmm. to someone um so most of them are pretty shy he was easy to take a picture like it took like a few seconds and i already had my <laughs> shot but some people have to like you know put on music and like mm -hmm. talk to them even though i know them like it could be a family mem member they feel like awkward sometimes mm -hmm. like well, mm -hmm. I'm in like art mode and they don't know me, but like in that <laughs> mode, they just yeah. know me as cousin or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, so sometimes I do like, well, put your hand here or just like, you know, swing your hips. So it's like, so, and then I have to teach them about our history with contrapasto and all that they don't want to hear. <laughs> so I'm just like, you know, just chill out. And then mm -hmm. sometimes it's just like, I'm not going to get the picture. So we just have a conversation. And while they're sitting, I take the picture. Okay. And then I get the picture. Okay. okay so it depends on the person. That's interesting. That's interesting. We'll get to the next one. Okay, so this is what happens with my work. So once I feel like I have figured something out, I get bored with it. So yes, I did all the collages, and yes, I did things for a long time. So I wanted to try a new medium besides I have also taken photography. I've done some ceramics, not that great, like I mentioned, with 3D stuff, but who knows, I might see it later. <laughs> so I ended up going to like a craft store or um, come up with these ideas while I'm sleeping, maybe they come as dreams where I write in my sketchbook or um, I end up going to Michael's because I want to, I don't know, make somebody something. So. At Michael's, there was this really tiny canvas that was six by six. And I was thinking about fibers and I was using thread. I just didn't know how to connect the dots. And this was on sale. 
and the thread was right next to it, which was cost one scale. And I'm like, <laughs> um, let's see if I can create a figure. Again, this is six by six inches on this canvas. So let's see what that looks like for color because I've been working with a lot of monochromatic images and I just want to see if I can get kind of like the same splatter effect with color. So I started off small, so this is six by six, and then I got a little bit bigger and also a little bit more sloppy. So I'm just like still trying to figure out how to tighten the thread in the background. I should have had a picture of the background so you guys could see a hot mess behind this one. <laughs> it was 18 by 15 inches, so we're getting a little bit bigger. And then <laughs> they got just massive. So I wasn't going to use thread, and I was like, oh, I can do yarn. Most of the thread is a little bit thicker. If I'm going to use yarn, what kind of background or ground am I going to use? So I had to do some research, and I thought about classic yarn or classic canvas what it's called, which you, you can see in this picture that it has those little holes in them so that you can thread the canvas in the back and you can kind of see here. So there's a lot of editing that ends up happening within this process. So I end up getting the plastic canvas and I draw on it. So you can kind of see like the blue grid. I do not grid though. This is just how the, the plastic canvas is sold. It has kind of like these blue lines. This particular image is seven and a half by, I want to say four and a half feet. So it's pretty large and it's an image of my husband who is standing in the street in um, Little Havana. And this is actually the street that he was standing in. So I just wanted to experiment to see if I can actually create a bigger figure and how would that look like in yarn. I was also thinking a lot about the history of the country, like I mentioned, and how we all. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, it's okay. It's okay. Yeah. Can I ask you to go back to the title, the the opening? I mean, back in the other direction where we just started, where this clip started. Yeah. Move back a little more. Um. No, that's okay. Um, it was I was looking at the title. There was a title that I came up with that I can't remember off the top of my head now. It had something. It's not in the. It's in the PowerPoint. Yeah. Yes, this is it. Creative discomfort, experimentation, and textures of visibility. Um, so academics are notorious for coming up with these like excessively long <laughs> titles, right? But I got to this point in the video and I was like, you know, one of the things that strikes me about you is like, when I first met you, I, it was, you were still working in portraits. You hadn't like dove into the fibers mm -hmm. yet. And, you know, I came, I was looking at the portraits. I'm like, oh man, this is hot, you know? And I was about to buy one of the painted portraits. And then I heard you say, you know, yeah, but I'm going to start working in yarn. I was like, who does that? <laughs> you know, in the sense that so much of our culture is about finding what works and then sticking to, sticking it. to it, right? Sticking to it. Um, and it's interesting. It's funny because I think as a literary cultural studies person, I'm always saying to my students, why rehearse what you know? Like, why would you come to school to rehearse what you know? The reason you come to school to is experiment. to experiment, right? And that's well and fine when you're talking about writing. You can write a sentence, it'll take you a minute or two. That's a totally different thing when you're talking about a piece that might take you a week to do. Mm -hmm. And then you're like, oh, no, I want to do something else, right? <laughs> how does that you typically, I mean, at what point did you decide, I know I know how to paint. I want to do something else. Because I'm thinking as well, when you, when you move from fiber, and even though I know, when you started experimenting with stained glass, I was like, but she just started fiber. Like, <laughs> so what's, you know, there's a part of me that's like, choose, choose a medium and stick to it. Uh -huh. But then every time I see what you come up with next, like, you all have to see the stained glass in the back, purifier, <laughs> right? Because when she was doing it, I, you know, she's, I love the fact that she puts these, the process on Instagram because I'm looking at it and I was like, what is she doing, right? crunching up the glass, like the kind of meticulous work involved. 
And it seems like as soon as you seem to have mastered one thing, you're like, okay, time to do something else, right? What drives that? I mean, is it, is it just genuine boredom or is it the sense of what if I tried this? Like what, what might happen? Because it's not like it's like, oh, I did this for five years and now I'm gonna change. We're talking like sometimes what, eight months, nine months? <laughs> you know, most people are like, okay, I've done this for five years. Now I'm gonna move on to I something I just else. feel like I can always come back to it. Like I started printmaking in middle school, but like that was, you know, linoleum and it's like stamps. I'm like, okay, whatever. It's like drawing that you cut and you ink and then you put it and you could do layers, whatever. Mm -hmm. And then when I got to grad school, that was the second time that I was like, oh, I'm going to try printmaking again. No lies, undergrad. And I took a few classes in printmaking in, undergr in undergrad because they had all these different types and ways and techniques of printing, which I really liked. Um, and then when I got to graduate school, I was painting and I always loved painting. But like, I feel like I know how to make jeans look like jeans and people's face look like their face. And if I really want to be photorealistic i can but why i could just take a picture like okay. so when we decided to have a family like i couldn't paint because of the turp and i couldn't print like i wanted to monotype printing which is like it's painting on glass and then running that through the machine which i was already painting on mm -hmm. glass so I was like, okay, well, I can't use that either. So what else can I make? So then I started cutting up my prints and like building little cities from them and then cutting out magazines. And then the piece of string fell on it. And I was like, oh, I don't have to do power lines anymore. I could just, you know, use string. <laughs> <laughs> so then my power lines in my collages became that. And then I got bored with that and I was pregnant. I'm like, okay, right, I guess I'll just do little watercolors. So then I was starting to do little watercolors of people on Instagram that had images already. So like okay. I was looking okay. at their pictures and I was asking, hey, can I make a portrait of you from mm -hmm. this picture? Is it OK? Get consent. It's important. Um, and then from there, I was like, well, fiber is like a, something that I, you know, can't hurt a fetus with. Mm -hmm. So let's see what that looks like. And that's how it started with the little mm -hmm. ones. Mm -hmm. Um, and then they just grew bigger. And I also think about like story, storage ah, because practical. of those glass doors. <laughs> All right. <laughs> um, and moving like the work into a storage space or like trans, how are you going to transport that? And my dad is getting older and my husband doesn't feel like carrying these heavy doors. So I'm like, fiber will be a, an easier way to like just mm -hmm. roll it up. Mm -hmm. Um, so all of that comes into play. And then with the glass, like I, I always love transparency, okay. like the idea of transparency, um, thinking about layers of people and like, you know, peeling yourself away like an onion and learning when to code switch and when not to mm -hmm. code switch mm -hmm. um, or when to behave like a good daughter versus <laughs> <laughs> something else. <laughs> um which is everyone so yeah, having like yeah. these multiple kind of identities mm -hmm. which is why the show is called intersectionality because there's so many layers in one person mm -hmm. like you and then as you get older things change so you change so i love that mm -hmm. like i love being able to see layers which is why i love printmaking i love photography i love painting like i just like the layering of certain things um so and fiber helps me do that because you can now you can see the front and the back yeah, of the pieces. Yeah. So like the backs make a statement about what happens in this country. And then the, the pieces on the floor is another statement of, you know, the outlining of these figures in certain places mm -hmm. and also like redlining and gridding and cities mm -hmm. in a subtle way. Yeah. Um, and then you get the powerful figures like see me because mm -hmm. I'm important, too. Mm -hmm. Um all that all but that it's interesting I love. because what i'm hearing you say too is that the form is connected to the subject right i love materiality and what it says to what i'm making mm -hmm. like that excites me but i didn't get there until graduate school when all of it like came together yeah and i'm like oh this is why i do what i do and why i like to do what i do 
So you are connecting the dots. I am. I have. <laughs> Back then, I didn't know okay. what the hell it is I was doing. I was mm -hmm. just making a make, and I was just like, whatever. But then, like, putting this show together all of it like just goes back to the same the same ideas mm -hmm. and different materials and it's interesting because that small piece and it's only in just looking at it that i realized that the first piece you did was tied to the small watercolor right and i was like oh my god i've seen those before but mm -hmm. i've seen them as small watercolors so there is whether you see it as and it's but it's interesting because it's a life circumstance of you getting pregnant that makes you move from one thing to another mm -hmm. and then to another. So again, thinking about the forms kind of being natural in their progression because you're responding to your environment, right? It, yeah. You know, the circumstances were because of the chemical components that mm -hmm. you work with, you can't work with them when you're pregnant. Right. But, you know, and it, it makes me think back to, you said, you know, when you were in uh, USF and you're like, this was a low point, I had to make work. Yeah. And, and that's like, clearly there have been all of these different times where you've had to stop for one reason or another, but that's an interesting statement because I was like, well, why did you have to make work? Right? I think that like, it's like art therapy too. It's like working through all the craziness of, it's a way of slowing down, like mm. being in the studio. I feel like even now, like trying to juggle, you know, being a professor and being a mom of two and being a wife and being all these other things. And also like, making art and and having a career in that realm and trying to juggle all the different roles that you have when i'm in the studio it's only me in the studio like me just listening to my hip-hop and just making work for hours until my husband's like yo you coming home it's, it's 12 <laughs> o'clock and i'm like oh yeah that's right i have a family <laughs> but like i feel mm -hmm. having those days if i'm not working like I feel it. Like mm -hmm. I haven't worked in like two days, and wow, I, and all I'm so thinking hard. about is like going to my studio and like finishing these four pieces that I already have like lined up. I just got to put them together. You know, it's interesting. You, I'm, I'm kind of new to Instagram. I mostly just go there and mind other people's business. I rarely, <laughs> I rarely ever post anything, but I enjoy the the pieces that you put on where we're watching the, the labor involved in it, right? Not just because it's like, oh, this is hard work, but they're, they're posts with your daughter in there doing her own thing and you're working and, you know, it's just, I almost want to say like you're in the space. So when you come and see these pieces in the, in the galleries and different exhibitions, you understand what it took to just get here. And we rarely ever see that mm -hmm. with, with contemporary artists, right? We see them during Basel, Miami Art Week, the pieces are done, done right? But why is that process important to you? Why, why, why? I mean, because it, it takes time to do that too, right? And things may not turn out like you expect. Oh, but... you have to cut that eyeball out, you know, because it doesn't <laughs> look right. You know? um, I, I want to make... I feel like when people think of artists is like, oh, but like, I don't feel like that. Right. I'm just like, I'm just a person who likes to create things. Like a lot of people, I feel like everybody creates something one way or another. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have to be like a physical piece. Like you're creating, you're putting on whatever outfit you wear every day. That's a creation. Mm -hmm. You're doing your hair some kind of way that's being creative. Like the way you arrange your food in the morning, like that's creative. So like, why? Does me making something have to be like here? Mm -hmm. Like I want people to be able to connect with me as just a person who makes mm -hmm. that also has a family. Mm -hmm. And I also want to inspire other artists because I feel like, especially women who want like to have a family, but they feel like they can't if they want to pursue the arts, which I think is bullshit. Mm -hmm. Especially if you have the right partner, mm -hmm. like you can do it. It's, it's a lot of work, but it's doable. Mm -hmm. So like, being an example for for those type of artists is important for me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think that's, I mean, I think I, I appreciate that because it also shows the amount of time that you spend you making, know, making. <laughs> yeah, because that's the other piece of it. You know, again, when you see it in a museum, it's done, right? We don't know what How went long? into it. Mm -hmm. We don't know, you know, what the processes were that got us there. And, you know, the fact that you're kind of literally walking us through the process 
sometimes. You know, I remember with that piece, the piece with Kai, you were trying a new kind of yarn and it was like yeah, shedding was everywhere. everywhere, man. It was such <laughs> a mess. <laughs> you know, but I was, because I'm watching it and I'm like, is it velvet? Because it look, I mean, you can see that online. I was like, this is not yeah, it's like the normal. Chanel. Yeah, it's like it's not normal yarn. So I'm like, and they're like, what are you using? Yeah. You know, it's like <laughs> so it's an int it's a different way of you know thinking about how technology can change and be that interface, right? To connect, thinking again about the title of the exhibition, right? That intersectionality between you know the viewer, the mm -hmm. maker, the the subject of the piece, you know. Um, that, that's a really important connection that we don't typically have to the process of producing art. I also think it's interesting when, with me working through them so that people can come in the space and say, oh, I remember her working on that. It's done. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Or like, oh, I remember she had a hard time doing this with that one, but it's, you know, it's mm -hmm. to the best of her ability. Like, I like that if people watch it and they see the piece that's already finish they have like this kind of memory of yeah of oh, how it got to working, that point yeah yeah which is yeah. nice too i think that's that's great is there one more i think is that the last I mean, that was one it, yeah that's the last one yeah so now i get to, to go off script that's the <laughs> <laughs> so i want to i want to ask you a little bit more about again going back to these ginormous pieces right mm -hmm. it's a far cry from that small piece yeah the watercolor why are they so big? <laughs> um, I want them to feel like they're going over you, where the person is, the viewer is not um, oh, okay. taking over the sitter or the model. I want the model to be bigger than the viewer so that mm. they feel and look powerful, so that you feel like you're engulfed in this person mm. instead of you looking down at them. I want them to look down at you mm. as a viewer. Um, especially being, you know, a minority, um, I think it's important of the way that you view them and how the viewer views them. That's so so perspective. Continues yeah. So to at be... times I'm like, you know, on the floor, like trying to take these <laughs> pictures of these people so that they look monumental, especially when they're short. Like Jade is really small. Okay. Like I'm five feet. She's I'm assuming five one. She's okay. around my height. Wow. Okay. So like being on the floor to be able to like capture that the per different perspective. Yeah, and she's also a big character too. Mm -hmm. So I'm like, oh, you know, you have to have a stronger perspective mm -hmm. um, to show it off. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I okay. like them to be large, mm -hmm. but I, I understand that like they can't all be large. Like I have to because I'm because I'll get like... I get bored with those too. Mm -hmm. So then I like make the little ones, like the one that's outside with the grills and the. Mm -hmm. The babushka uh, Sheldon, um, because that's another way of not being bored with fiber. And what about moving them? So there was an earlier period where a lot of your work was landscape, urban landscape. Yes. And now it's interesting that I'm seeing that landscape come back, but with these figures. Yes. Incorporated, you know, <laughs> intersecting again with that landscape. Um, how did that come about? Again, I, I'm sure experimental. You're like, okay, I'm doing this thing, but I used to do this thing. And what if I put these two things together? Um, I was playing around with landscapes and figures for a long time. Anyway, even if I'm doing like my collaging, there mm -hmm. was still like the collage and the silhouette of the person mm -hmm. or the person on top. So it was always something. Um, and then I was like, well, what would it look like if, you know, the holes can see through the space like hanging mm -hmm. them so that okay. you can see literally mm -hmm. the real landscape that's in the background mm -hmm. um like i had a show in i think it was in um massachusetts and they hung it on the window and like it was like cityscape in the background and i'm like oh that's it for me mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. so even like those kinds of installations are important for some of the work like some of them don't need it because the figure's so strong Mm -hmm. But others, the ones that do have landscapes, I'm like, they need like something else that can connect them with the space. Mm -hmm. Because to me, like there's something that doesn't feel like they belong in that, mm -hmm. if that makes sense. And I think that, no, it makes a lot of sense because I know you talk about this in a couple of other interviews about sort of American history and where, you know, when we look at these landscapes, we tend to think about them even if they are quote unquote empty, they're always already filled, 
right? right. Somebody built, somebody made right. that building, somebody laid these railroad tracks, right? Mm -hmm. That there's a way that there's, there's, there's a presence, right? There's a presence in that history, even in landscape portraiture, right? So and I think so much of what, you know, some art historians talk about as a visual regime, the way we learn to look at things, right? You know, you, when you looked at plantation paintings, there were never any slaves in the plantation, mm -hmm. but we know that they were there, right. right? And so there's a way that it seems like your work is always reminding us, right? That even if the space itself is right. just buildings and all these wires, that there are people there, right? And there's spaces, human presence there, yeah. You know, which is really powerful because I think, and again, using, I mean, again, happenstance, but using the yarn as wire, right? Mm -hmm. it, reminds us again, you know, of the connections as it were in our urban landscapes. And I think it's interesting that most of your landscapes are urban as mm -hmm. opposed to parks and different things like that, you know? And is that just a reflection of your environment? Or... Oh yeah, I grew up like in the city. So like everything for me is cityscape. Mm -hmm. I went on a residency to Rabin County, Georgia, and it was just like fields and fields and mountains. I was like, what am I gonna make here? Like, this is it's just flat lands. Like, I'm just gonna be painting grass all day. Um, and, and they're beautiful to look at, mm -hmm. but like to try to create, like that doesn't interest me. Like I like, you. yeah, I like the, the complexity of cities. Like, you know, there's a broken window, like right in front of like this five story revamped luxury apartment like how are these in the same space mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um that's interesting yeah yeah because there's a story there right they're, right they're they're competing narratives right work, right and, and, <laughs> and i can see you getting in there like okay how, what's the relationship how do these two things intersect right mm -hmm. how, what what set of circumstances again you're thinking about the grids and redlining, right? Because all of that is part of the architecture of the right. city as well, right? When we see these, you know, revamp, refurbished homes, right? There's a whole unseen mm -hmm. narrative about that that involves, you know, people, right? Yeah. You know, making making big decisions about people who aren't necessarily empowered to intervene in those decisions. Right? Right. So I think that's really powerful when I look at your work in the larger landscape of, of you know, people and their environment. And again, I go back to that that drawing, <laughs> that little kid. It's like, to me, there was that that moment. I was like, this this all makes sense now. This makes this makes a lot of sense. Yeah, that was weird. Like I'm looking through my dad's album. I'm like, why is this here? But I kept it for some reason. So he had an mm -hmm. eye. That's good. That's good. I would like to open it up if there are people in the audience that have questions. Oh. He's like, yes, jump right in. <laughs> Um, I'm thinking like when it came to stained glass, I feel like the concept of stained glass was what attracted me first before like finding pieces of glass. And also like our history um, plays a part in it too. And like what, where are things missing is something that I ask all the time. Mm -hmm. Like where have we not been depicted, which we've been in spaces mm -hmm. and I feel like the materiality of things, especially now, um, connect me to those things. Like I'm, I've never tried stained glass before, but there was an innovation grant from Broward and I'm like $10,000, like I can make a lot of things with $10,000. <laughs> um, but I knew I needed classes because I don't, I wasn't gonna go on YouTube and like figure <laughs> out how to create stained glass mm -hmm. and buy all this stuff that I didn't need. So there's a, um, a professor, her name is Carol um, Wardell, who teaches stained glass and she's been teaching stained glass for like 40 years um, in her shop in Fort Lauderdale. And I just looked up her, her information. I took a beginner's stained glass class. It was like we had to make a little, sh you know, sailboat in the water. But like in her space, there was like all these different colors of glass and different textures. and 
like fusion of glass. There's mm -hmm. so many things you could do with glass. I was like, yo, I'm like looking around like you could sandblast glass. You can like <laughs> put the glass together. You could paint on them and then put that in the kiln. I was like, oh, this is crazy. So like that, the, the materiality of that excites me because there's so many things that you can do. Like there's so many things I can do besides yarn with fiber, which I'm already like, there's the part of my list in my head on my phone <laughs> um, that I want to try to to do because it's new. Um, and I think I just like experimenting, messing up, and then learning how to do it better. And then once I feel like I figured out the best, then I want to move on to something else. Like I feel like I haven't figured out yarn the best way yet, which is what keeps me in it. Um, but yeah, that stained glass boat was something else. And then I had to convince her like, hey, <laughs> this is what I want to make. How do I make these people out of stained glass? And she's just like, what, what is happening? <laughs> I'm like, how do I make this look like this? She's like, you can't do that. I was like, I need to do it. So how do we do it? Like, what kind of techniques can we figure out to do it? Because I need him to have grills and I need the grills to have gums. And I need the girls to be shiny. So how do we do that? <laughs> She's like, I'll get back to you. I'm like, okay. <laughs> and she figured out something. And I was like, okay, we got it. Mm -hmm. So that was, that was great. But see, for me too, that's like, that's how you know you're a portrait artist, right? Because it's interesting. I would think that you're like, okay, obviously you can't do these things in glass, right? Grills in glass. Yeah, that's going to happen. But it's, you're like, of course it can happen. Yeah, right? there I don't has know to how, be a way, but, right? You know, and again, it's it's this to me. It seems like a belief that you can render the human form. You just have to figure out how to push the material mm -hmm. beyond what we think the material is capable of. Right, right. Because when I look at the 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 yarn pieces, I'm like, oh my god. I mean, it looks like a photograph, right? And I, I that has to be hard to get the lighting and the the wrinkles in the face. Like it, it's it's all there, right? It's Which, fun. <laughs> it looks tedious as hell it looks very very tedious i i cannot work if i'm on a piece for two weeks i'm going crazy like the these large ones mm -hmm. i go crazy because i want to finish them and like i have to also like be on mom mode too and teacher mode so like i have to dedicate certain times and like once the two weeks is done and i'm still thinking about this piece i'm going <laughs> crazy like i want to get it done at that point because i already have that lined up and that lined up and that lined up in my head. Yeah. But I'm like, I know what yarn I'm going to use for that. I know what that's going <laughs> to be. You're, look you're like. on to the next thing. Yeah, I'm already, already like. Okay, okay. Other questions? Yes, go ahead. So then, so when you started the, the yarn pieces, um, did you do any kind of like learning or did you, to me, it just looks like you went about it just like you do. I mean, even that early charcoal drawing, it looks like those same kind of gestures. Your... Yeah, yeah, I didn't know. Your... Yeah. And when I do, <laughs> when I teach, like my first fiber workshop that I taught, there was a lot of older white women that came. Like they've been knitting and embroidering and crocheting for so long. And I'm like, okay, we're going to skip holes. And they're like, whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> what are you talking about? I'm like, I don't know how you've been taught how to make this. I'm, I don't know what I'm doing, but this is how I make them, where I skip holes and I cross hatch. And sometimes they go in one direction because that's what the fold looks like in the picture. And other times it goes in another direction because that's a facial structure that it should be. Um, and they lose their shit every time. <laughs> and then they ask me questions like, do you know the stitching pattern? number?" I was like, I don't know what you're talking about, <laughs> like at all. There's like no connection there. Wow. <laughs> because I think I think like it as if it's a brush. Like there's the real thin, mm -hmm. the thin yarn, which I can really get like intricate details. The same thing goes with thread. Like the thread has six different threads that like, you know, make it the bigger one. But if I'm, you, if I'm trying to do the eye, I'm like breaking up oh. the threads so okay. that I have a thinner thread, like mm -hmm. a thinner paintbrush. And then when there's like a space where you want to, um, like Kai, make it a little thicker so it doesn't take me as long to create it. Then I get a thicker yarn, not knowing that the yarn, you know, just like crumbles, which was fun. 
but like working with that, um, I enjoy. And I mean, it's interesting because the folds, it, it literally, you get the yeah, folds, folds and the pants and everything, right? Which is phenomenal. And I mean, as I look across like your catalog, but also this exhibition, there's some of these pieces like the one behind me and I was like, she needs to take photos with people with plain colored pants, not, oh, no. not the checkers. And, <laughs> because I'm looking at this and I'm like, oh my God, it's, you know, it's all of these pieces, like the intricacy, because you're capturing the pattern of plaid pants. When we talk, when I think about tedious, I'm like that, if tedious was a process, that would be it. Because I'm sure that must have been really difficult but I, to But do. I like that. Like, I like. But honestly, you're not like, screw this. I'm just going to make it blue. No. Like, <laughs> I don't tell the people what to wear. Like, they, I said, hey, I'm going to take a picture of you. Are you okay? I'm paying you. It's at this time. I'll meet you wherever you feel the most comfortable, which is probably at their house. Mm -hmm. And they pick their outfits. Sometimes people have, like, two or three outfits, and they're like, what do you think? And I'm just like, just pick whatever you want. Like, I'm not going to facilitate mm -hmm. or tell you what you need to wear. Just... Mm -hmm wear what you feel like makes you feel the most badass mm -hmm. so they you know pick their outfits and i i love it when it's complicated <laughs> while i'm doing it i hate it like the the des dress over there like oh that God. drove me insane because i wanted to be done with it but i'm also like that's gonna look fire when i'm done with it there's like i don't even know how many elephants are in that dress of different colors and i'm just like nope I'm going to replicate what it looks like. Um, I, I don't really like half-assing things either. So, so you've but when I do her, mm -hmm. then I'm like, I need a break. Okay. And I end up doing like Kai <laughs> mm -hmm. because his outfit is easier to try to do. And mm -hmm. then after Kai, then I'll do Rohan. Rohan was the last one that I created. Mm -hmm. um, but his isn't as intricate as hers. Hers like really, that was a lot. And, and her pants was a lot too. Yeah, that's it. I mean, every time I see them, I'm just like, wow, you know, this. So ha has there ever been a time someone's come out in an outfit and you've been like, no, not that. No. <laughs> no. That's because, terrible. Well, no. I, mean, no, but, I mean, just in the sense, there's the piece, I don't think it's in here, but the one with the handkerchief. Oh, yeah, her handkerchief outfit. She had an entire outfit that's all of the different colors of the handkerchief with the paisley patterns. Like red, green, yellow, like the entire outfit was. And I, when I saw that photograph, I was like, there is no way in hell. Do you have um, internet? You can look it up so What's it they called? can see it. Yeah. Um, it's called Lorianne. Because I, that would have been an outfit where I would have been like, no, let's try something different. No, so <laughs> I want to um, have her pull it up first so they can see it. And it's in the. Um, the fiber, yeah, that one. In the fiber, right there. You the, could um, click. Oh. Um, go down, down, down. Where is she? There she yes. is. That one. <laughs> okay. So with Lorian, I had an art opening in December of last year. It was during Art Basel. And she was like walking around with her friends. I never met this lady. So she's like walking around and the minute, and I was with my husband and the minute I saw her, he saw her too. And then he looks at me and he's like, you better go. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> so I went over, I introduced myself. I explained it and she was down. She's like, okay. And I took a picture and then I printed the picture when I got home. I'm like, how in the world am I going to do this outfit? Um, that that so one and Des were the ones yeah, that drove just me so crazy. I can see your face as well. Yeah, the whole thing. Yeah, yeah. I mean, <laughs> what do you mean? How long did it take to do this piece? Thirty-five hours for that. I I like tab my my hours on my stuff because I'm I was going crazy with this one. Well, but the end result was nice. I think. Very. I mean, it's just every time I see that piece, it's one of the pieces that's stuck in my head because I, I can. I mean, this is why I'm not an artist. I'd have been like this, but in in this case, it was it happened. She already had right? it. Right. She already had it, and I could imagine 
you know, yeah, I'm picking out my Basil outfits now because, you know, that, that matters, uh -huh. right? But walking through and seeing, you know, because she looks like an interesting woman. Yeah. The hair, you know, everything. That it's like, of course, right? I, I'm with your husband there. Of course. Yeah, right? we were just like, he's like, you need to go. I was like, okay. <laughs> you know, but I mean, it's a striking piece, but I look at it and it's just, it just seems maddening because it's, apart from the colors, the handkerchiefs don't all line up. It, it's right. not There's a perfect wrinkles. neat, yeah. you know, it, they're, it's amazing. It's amazing, you know. I enjoy that. I enjoy the, the challenge of it, which is probably why I, I try other materials because it's a mm -hmm. challenge to see if I can do it or not. Wow. Other questions? <laughs> yes. Oh. Um, hmm. yes, like I know I want it to look like the photograph, but there's sometimes where I change the yarn, um, depending on how intricate I want certain areas to be hmm. like for, for Kai, I, the thicker ones just to fill in the space faster. But I really like where there's a shadow of his like hands touching hmm. and like the, the intricate differences of the shading when it comes to those shadows because he had multiple shadows in his work i like the juxtaposition of it being like super thick versus super thin mm -hmm. um within one space because it also flattens it out so it kind of looks mm -hmm. three-dimensional yeah. but you can't see any of that in a photograph right. right like i'll take a picture and people think it's a painting they're like oh that's a nice painting i'm like no 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 it's yarn oh it's yarn <laughs> You know, like I, I also enjoy that because they, you can see that I'm a painter, mm -hmm. even with the materials. I'm still painting. It's just with a different. Mm -hmm. It's not paint. It's yarn. But it's also there's a photographic element to that mm -hmm. piece with that because of the shadow, right? Because it's that's what blew me away. I was like, okay, wait, is that did she actually get the shadow in there in yarn? Because it's that. So it's a combination of painting and photography. Yeah, even with Lori Ann's too, even with the handkerchief, there's, you know, darks in the red, like right by her shoulder. There's like a burgundy versus like the really bright red. And then even where there's a shadow in the burgundy, there's also right. a shadow in the white. So it's a gray instead of like a stark white. That's like painting. So learning how to create that in a painting and then transitioning that into yarn, it's the same. It's just you know, switching it out and mm -hmm. not being like, oh, fuck it. It's not going to look like a, like a, uh, uh, what do you call it? A wrinkle. When you know the wrinkle's there, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. just put it in. It's going to take more time, but it's going to look more realistic. Hmm. Other questions? I saw another hand. You had a second question. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions going, going once? Well, thank you very much for this. This is the discussion I've been waiting to have <laughs> with you, you know, since the first piece of your work that, you know, I mean, friends don't let friends experience art alone. If you have good friends, they see art and then they're like, look, you need to go and see this. So my dear friend, Erica James, went and visited right. Candy's studio and came back and she's like, you need to go north. Go north, my friend. Go north. And it took us a while. It I took did. us it took us a couple of months before we could get on the same page. But she was like, Pat, you're gonna love her work. Just go. She's like, Yeah, I can show you what I got and you can it's look not online. Same. She's like, but go. She's like, I live in Cutler Bay. And she's like, You gotta drive up to Bower. <laughs> and uh, and I I think that was one of the best pieces of advice that that she gave me because it really as both a collector and an art critic, I mean, this, you know, for me as a collector, it's not just about acquiring the piece, but also spending time in the studio with the artists, their process, what kind of research they're doing, you know, the whole body of knowledge, experience and all of that that goes into it. So when I first started, you know, visiting, bringing friends, because if you're a good friend, you bring other friends. Yeah, right? a lot it's, of other friends. You know, nice. bringing a lot of friends into this, just so we could talk about this, you know, amazing, you know, body of work that, that you've been engaged in. And so it's like, finally, this is like, you know, 
the this is the first conversation we're having formal right but um i'm imagining it's the first of many so thank you for thank inviting you. me to do this thank you to coral springs art museum for inviting inviting us to have this conversation and thank you all for coming out and participating in it and please you have the artist here take a look at the exhibition ask her questions that i may have forgotten to ask her and thank you all <laughs>